Australian author Karen Turner joins Hawkesbury Library Service for a chat about her life, writing and her new book Stormbird, which is her third stunning novel transporting the readers back to wartime Britain, a place depicted in many of Karen's earlier childhood memories. Hi, Karen, and thank you for joining me for a chat today. Um, Hi, Julia. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Before we get started talking about your new book, Stormbird, um, I was wondering if you'd like to share some of your story, how you became Karen Turner author. It's actually a long story, so I'll try to condense it down (laughs) for you. But uh, as a little girl, I always loved to read. And there comes a point in every reader's life where they think maybe I should be writing as well. Um, And that happened to me very, very early in life. And I started probably around 10 years old writing my own little golden books and illustrating them very badly and making a library of them. And then uh, after a few years of that, you kind of move into your teens and school and jobs and boyfriends and going out with friends. It got all in the way. And I ended up having a career in the financial services. And I was um, writing a lot of legislative material for financial planners, um, training financial planners, writing um, financial articles for magazines. And it kind of led into a world where I thought I'm actually combining my love of writing and my passion for writing with what I'm doing for a living. So I had this epiphany about what if I was to hey, quit my day job and write a book. Um, that was a gradual process. It's not something that you can just quit your day job and write a book. No. So it was a <laughs> it was a gradual process over maybe about 10 years where I drifted from full-time work to part-time work that enabled me to start writing. So from beginning to write around 10 years old, there was a gap of around 30 years where I didn't do any writing at all. And then suddenly it's gone bang and now I'm a writer and have been for about 12 years now uh, as a professional writer. So not just novels, I also write uh, technical material for big organisations and small organisations. I write a lot of learning material and uh, um, articles for magazines and all sorts of things. Wow, that's quite diverse, isn't it? (laughs) It's very diverse. Yes. Yes. So how much of your parents' and grandparents' heritage flows through into your novels? Well, my father's family was Italian and I have to say not a lot of that flows through into my novels, although I spend a lot of my writing time in Italy where I isolate myself. Um, my books were set in the UK and my mother's family was from Yorkshire and when I was 19 I was saving up for my first car but instead of buying the car I bought an airline ticket and moved to Yorkshire and lived in a village outside of Leeds with my grandma and it was there that I just fell in love with everything that is England. We know what it's like, you know, the rolling countryside, Mm. stone walls, the old buildings, the history, and the characters and stories just started to flow. And uh, it wasn't until many years later that I was able to fulfil that passion and write a book. But that um, immersion in, in England and in the countryside really established itself in my heart. And... I visit regularly, I go back to Yorkshire regularly and um, the ideas and the characters still keep flowing. So they, they are very significantly a part of my writing. Right, mm, lovely. Now let's start talking about Stormbird, your new novel. Mm. Um, mm. So I understand it represents five years of your writing career. That's a yes. long time to be working on <laughs> one book. <laughs> That's right. It's a fat book. Have you seen how fat it is? It's wow. It's a fat book. It's about um, 700 and something pages. My goodness. Yes. Now, how much research is involved in writing such a large novel and um, how do you make it historically accurate? Uh, well, fortunately, Stormbird was set in 1941, so... World War One, well, uh, sorry, World War Two had been going mm-hmm. for a couple of years at that point, and uh, there is an awful lot of material out there. Uh, books in libraries, reference books in shops. There's uh, uh, online is an amazing resource these days because 
there is so much information. Mm. I saw ration books. I saw photographs. Wow. I visited locations that still exist because World War I, historically speaking, was not that long ago for you know, England particularly. Mm. So you can go there and still see the places where it happened. Additionally, my mother was born in, in Leeds in 1941. So she was born at that time that this book is set. And a lot of the anecdotes and uh, just little details about the way people live their daily lives were directly from my mum and what wow. she remembered as a child growing up in that time. Such a difficult time to be growing up too. I know mm, that... Well, my um, mum is... Sorry, go. Sorry, my, my mum has told me so many stories about what she didn't know and what she didn't have. An interesting um, anecdote was that there was no toothpaste available to her during the war. So they used to brush their teeth using the soot out of the inside of the chimney. And, I mean, we all know the benefits of charcoal, charcoal. now for your teeth. Yes. Well, when she migrated to Australia, she was 14 and she never used toothpaste and she had these perfect white teeth and she became a poster child for a toothpaste company oh. in Australia, and yet she'd never used toothpaste. Wow. <laughs> I might go out to the fireplace and grab some salt. <laughs> yeah, just, just get a log off the fire. <laughs> oh, wow. So when you start writing a novel, do you always know where it's going to lead you? Do you have a set plan? And what about a clear idea of how it's going to finish? I, it's very interesting. I don't know a lot about how other writers do it. Mm. Um, I do know that some of the big names out there like to plot everything in paper. I've never written anything down. I tend to see the story and the characters rolling out like a movie in my head. And um, I see the characters, I see what they look like. I hear the dialogue, I see the settings. And for me, it's just about writing what I see so that my readers can see it too. Mm. I. Well, I see the layout of it kind of like a timeline, like when you're doing a project and you have uh, the beginning, you have milestones along the way, and then you've got the end. So my milestones are like the important things, the, the dramatic things that happen to my characters in the story, and they can go up and down and up and down, but they're the milestones along the way. And the story is what fills the gap between those milestones. That's the bit I don't know. So as I'm writing, I know the milestones. I know what dramatic thing is going to happen next. But how I get to that point is the story that I write. And then I tend to know the ending. And sometimes because the writing process takes me all around the place between milestones, sometimes I get to the ending at a different spot or sometimes it's a little bit varied. But it's pretty much as I see it. With Stormbird, it's interesting because um, the ending doesn't come till the epilogue. And even at the time I was writing the epilogue, I wasn't quite sure myself whether I was going to get to the ending or not and whether it was how I envisioned it. And it kind of was. Um, but I've had a lot of people say it's amazing that we've got to the very end of the book and we don't even know what the outcome is going to be until we read the epilogue. Wow. Uh, because, and the fact is that. I wasn't entirely certain myself. I knew where my characters would end up. I just wasn't sure how. So I'll leave that with you. <laughs> I look forward to reading it, that's for sure. So when you were writing <laughs> the first novel, so the Stormbird's part of a trilogy. So That's Torn, right. The first one is Torn. Torn. Yeah. Did you know that it was going to be part of a trilogy or did that just happen when you got to the end? I actually thought it was going to be part of two books. Right. Because um, Torn... Torn is the story of a young girl living in this house in Yorkshire and the story of her life I, I thought would be one bit and then Stormbird would be the same house many years later. But Alexandra's life became so detailed and such a story in its own right that it became two books right. and in Violate is the sequel. Mm -hmm. So what I have imagined from the beginning to be just a, a book, of, uh, a set of two became a set of three. And because of that, because Torn and Inviolate are set during the Regency time, um, and there is a big gap between Regency and World War II, 
I wrote Stormbird so that it could actually be read independently in mm -hmm. its own right as a single book or for people who have read Torn and Inviolate, they could read Stormbird and it would naturally flow on. So um, if you've never read any of my books, you could go straight in and read Stormbird or you could start with Torn and Inviolate and then Stormbird. And naturally, I like everybody to read Torn and then of course. Inviolate and then Stormbird. Of course, yes. <laughs> but um, I have had quite a lot of reviews from people. I, um, some comments from people that have read Stormbird first and thought, oh, we really like that, but we need to understand a little bit more about the prelude. Mm -hmm. So they've gone back and read Torn and Inviolate and it's worked. So I was chuffed about that because when I wrote it, I had in mind that they would be read as a threesome, but I didn't quite, and I hoped that Stormbird could stand alone, but I never envisioned people reading Stormbird first and then going back and reading the other two. So I'm glad that they were. That's good. That's good. So how do you come up with the titles for these novels? Oh dear. Well, <laughs> for a lot of a lot of iterations. I, I could never make up my mind with Torn and my husband came up with that. Um, one day he read the manuscript and he said, Oh, it should be called Torn. And I thought, yeah, I like that. Um, I always knew Inviolate would be called Inviolate because I always liked that word and I thought given my character Something that is inviolate is something that hasn't changed. It has had things happen to it, but it has stayed the same. And mm. that's how I saw my character. She has moved through a world where things have been thrown at her and terrible situations have happened and she's grown and evolved through all of this. But essentially, the one driving purpose, which you have to read the book to find out what that is, um, her one driving purpose has never changed. She's never wavered in that. And so I called him Violate, Violate Stormbird. It's a very interesting name for that. <clears throat> when I was researching World War II, uh, my German character was a Luftwaffe pilot. Mm -hmm. And I was looking into the sorts of planes that were being flown by the Luftwaffe at the time. And uh, they had the Dornier, they had the Junkers, and they had the Messerschmitt uh, 132. But they were testing the Messerschmitt 209 and that was the one that I, I had in mind because the Luftwaffe used to have little nicknames for all of their planes. And the one that they were testing, the, the latest Messerschmitt, was uh, called a Sturmvogel, which in German means um, Stormbird. And as soon as I found that out, I thought, right, That's it. my book has to be called Stormbird. And I changed it slightly to say that my, my captain was a test pilot for the Messerschmitt because at the time that the action in my book was taking place, the Messerschmitt um, was not actually in full service. So I had, in order to use the title Stormbird, yes. I had to make him a test pilot of the Sturmvogel. So that's how Stormbird came about. And I love that word. I just love it. So I, I had to make it the title. You had to make it fit too. <laughs> yeah. I did, I did, I had to make it fit. But you know, nobody's complained. Everyone no, to be in no. love with Anton. So yeah. No, I think it's great. So when you finish writing your novels, do you then go back and read them from beginning to end? Or have you ever read them all? Yes, I do. Well, that's a um, curly question, I think. <laughs> it is a curly question because when you're writing a book, especially when you're going through draft after draft, all of my books go through about six or seven drafts before they get to the editor and then they go through, you know, another two or three. So, and during that time, you're reading them in chunks. Yes. And you're working with the editor on a chunk. And then you might be on chapter 35 and then you chunk back to chapter 15 and then you do this and then my editor will go, look, you know, I think we need to look at this. And then, so you're all over the shop. Mm -hmm. And you, you, and I tend to, when I sign off on chapter after chapter, it's in chunks. So you very rarely, well, I very rarely read from start to finish. I have to say, though, um, Torn and Inviolate, Torn was um, first published in 2013 and Inviolate was first published in 2014. So that's six years ago now. I read both of those books from start to finish as a reader this year. So six years later, I sat down and actually read my books. And, and did you enjoy them? Though, well, 
even though I knew the ending, yes, I did enjoy them. And then I thought, gee, it's good I enjoyed them. Imagine if I didn't. Imagine. So, <laughs> imagine if you then started thinking, oh, wow, I wish the writer had done this or done that with the character. Or, or imagine going like this. Well, that oh. was rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Scrap that, that actually, start again. <laughs> I, I actually really enjoyed them. So I was really pleased with that. And I thought, wow, I need to write some more like that. Yes, <laughs> keep going, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> so do you ever think about your novels being turned into movies? And if so, who would you have playing the lead roles? Oh, man, you know, when I think about this all the time. Do you? And I, have, I do, and not so much movies. I, I see Torn and Inviolate as TV shows, you know, right. Downton and Abbey style. And, in fact, a couple of reviewers independently on Goodreads have said, Oh, these remind me of Downton Abbey. So, of course, I start thinking, oh, Downton Abbey, torn, you know. Yes. Um, however, Stormbird, I think, would make a really great short-run TV series, you know, like they do on Netflix for, say, they did, like, The Bodyguard and things like that for, like, yes. eight, eight episodes. Mm -hmm. I think Stormbird would make a really, really good one of those. And I know who exactly would play my lead character. My lead character is a lady called Jessica. And the young lady called Sophie Skelton, who plays Brianna in Outlander, Perfect. I've met her. Yes. I have met her and she's a lovely lady. She's actually English. So even though in the TV show she's got an yes. American accent, yes. she's actually English. And uh, I've met her personally. She's a lovely lady. And I've already decided, I don't know what she thinks about it. She <laughs> probably hasn't even thought about it. But I've decided she's going to be my Jessica. So... She wow. doesn't know it yet. <laughs> Movies yeah. in the making. We'll see what happens. Watch this space. Yes. Fingers crossed. Yes. No, you know, it's one of those plans. I think every writer goes through this. Thing. Oh, imagine if I could make a movie, and that's like so far in the distance that it doesn't even exist. So, yeah. but it's a dream. It's a well, dream. you I'm never know. It. Dreams can come true. They can. They can. You just have to put it out there can. and see what happens. Exactly. Exactly. Tell the universe what you want, and be yes. a really good. person. And it just might happen. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah. Now, yeah. your next novel, is it too cheeky of me to ask any details about this next novel coming? No, it's not. A lot of people are asking, so I'm telling. Um, it's going to be set in the Victorian goldfields during the gold rush time, like Eureka, so the 1850s. Um, and that's because I was almost well, kind of, no, not almost all kind of. I was shamed into writing something in Australia because I'm Australian. All my writing takes place in the UK. I've had a lot of people saying to me, come on, write something in Australia. So, yes, my, I have started it. I know how it's going to end. It's just a few years off yet, but I have started work on it. And uh, as soon as we come out of lockdown and we're allowed to go out and, you know, be normal again, I yes. like to spend some time in Ballarat and Sovereign Hill and immersing myself in that time so that I can feel the story around me and then put mm. it down. I, I, I really need to, you know, immerse myself in the environment and the space and also get to talk to people about, you know, and go to the historical societies and find out you know, how did people live, how did they wash their clothes, how did they, mm. you know, the ladies living on the gold fields yeah, we hear about what it was like as a minor, but good heavens, imagine being a woman there. Imagine all the women, the things you've got to go through, oh. living in an environment that is so primitive and mm. without, you know, anything, not even... Wood for, wood for fires and looking after children. Water, I can't imagine. You know, how, do you, mm. how do you, you know, you carry water in buckets and that's what you've got to survive with is a bucket of water for the day. Mm. And, Mm. Uh, we talk about the mod cons that they had in the 1850s. These ladies didn't even have that. No. So I need to know what it must have been like. Mm. How to scrape a meal together for children mm. out of what? Mm. You know? How to catch um, and kill and, and then cook. Oh, yes. yeah, <laughs> that's right, right. So, yeah, I, when we get out of this situation we're in now, I'm going to go spend some time really immerse myself in that environment and start to ask questions of the people that know that history and start doing some serious research because at the moment I'm writing but it's it's first draft and it doesn't have that detail in it yet to, mm. to bring it to life and I'm really into that 
for detail. I really like my history to be factual. I love historical fiction. Um, and I think there's a place for the bodice ripper and there's a place for fluff, but I don't write that. I do want to write factual history and mm. it's just going to take some time. Do you think that will be a standalone novel or will it lead on to, I guess you won't know until you're in it. And no, then... no. You know what? You know what? Um, it's funny because I said to my husband just the other day that this book I can see how it's going to end and I can see that it's going to end with an opportunity for the next generation story to be told. Um, but let's just leave that be for now because I really have to write this one first. Yes, you do. <laughs> you do. <laughs> but you I, do. I, I, because I know the ending, I can see where it could lead on to something else, but I just need to draw a line there and say just focus on the job at hand. Yes. Yes, that's hard. That's hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think um, I'd like you to come back if you wouldn't mind when you've written this next one and have another chat. Definitely. Definitely. But, um, yeah. So thank you very much for joining me today, Karen. It was lovely to talk well, to thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. for having me. Juliet. You're welcome. Thank you. thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.